on your marks, get set, go. If you ever ran a race as a kid, then you know that expression. An expression which took me about five seconds to say. Five seconds and we are off racing, hiding, playing. Every five seconds, another child becomes a refugee. About half of the approximately 85 million displaced people in the world are children under the age of 18, forced to flee their homes due to war, climate change, or other forms of persecution. Since 2018, over one million children have been born into refugee life. We are now witnessing an entire generation of displaced kids. A generation displaced. Let's call them Generation D. Imagine what it would feel like if everything that anchored your life, family, neighborhood, school, friends, just violently fell apart. Suddenly you're floating in a world you don't understand. You feel like a ghost. My name is Jennifer McDonald, and I am a mother, teacher, Arabic linguist, and co-founder of Hadaya Global. For the last 20 years, in an effort to become a better teacher and a more empathetic human being, I've traveled the world, sometimes for weeks or months at a time, and with a particular interest in the people and cultures of the Middle East. My job was to witness, connect, and listen. So in the summer of 2014, just three years after the outbreak of the Syrian civil war, I made my first visit to an informal refugee camp in the Bekaa Valley of Lebanon. The camp was so close to the border of Syria, you could still hear explosions and see flares from inside of Syria. The refugees there, mostly women, whose husbands had either died, been arrested, or stayed to fight, and children. The housing was made up of a few UNHCR tents fortified with blue tarps and then patched together with the burlap of old coffee sacks. Almost no potable water, brutal heat during the day, freezing temperatures at night, and no escape from the wind. One shared composting toilet and a shower rigged from a hose. That's the thing about being displaced. The trauma of exile, it's a shared experience. It is never yours alone. Meanwhile, across the ocean in America, I'd just been through a really painful divorce and moved into a 700 square foot cottage with my two young kids. We downsized so severely that they were each only allowed a small box full of cherished items a set of watercolors, a favorite book, some medieval figurines. Visiting the camps put into perspective just how precious these few playthings were and how lucky we were to have a roof, any roof, over our heads. The first thing I saw when I entered the camp was a group of seven young boys led by an exuberant redhead named Omar. They were huddled on the ground around an object that had captured their full attention. As I got closer, I saw that it was a single deck of miniature playing cards that had been used so much they were almost completely blank. I have no idea what kind of game Omar and his friends had created using a deck of cards without numbers or suits, but they were doing it. The urge to play was so strong, they had found a way. It turns out the urge to play is more than just a desire for frivolous fun. It is a profound biological process that has evolved across species to promote survival. It's essentially a tutorial in coping with real life challenges and forming important social bonds. Today, I'm going to talk about why play matters and how it is an absolute game changer, no pun intended, in the lives of displaced youth. But first, 
Who are they? Who are these 35 million displaced kids? And where do they come from? They come from Syria, South Sudan, Myanmar, Yemen, Iraq, Afghanistan, as of a few days ago, the Ukraine, the Palestinian territories, and many other countries. Major host countries are Turkey, Iran, Pakistan, Lebanon, Jordan, Greece, Uganda, Bangladesh, and Germany. And although the US is far, far behind any European country in terms of refugees hosted, our little town of Asheville recently became home to several Afghani families. They are your new neighbors. <laughs> what many people don't realize, and what I didn't realize, was that even if a refugee is initially provided with some kind of aid from a large organization, once an emergency turns into a long-term displacement, which it frequently does, the aid stops unless you've got cash. This was the case at the settlement I visited in Lebanon. Refugee moms and dads were scrambling to pay rent for that little bit of rocky ground where Omar and his friends were playing something resembling cards. I say playing, but what exactly is play? The renowned play researcher Stuart Brown defines play as an absorbing, apparently purposeless activity that provides enjoyment and a suspension of self-consciousness and sense of time. Play can be individual, collaborative, imaginative, physical. We were designed to do it. And when we stop doing it, we start dying. Smiling is a form of play. And most of us first experience this in the bond that we form with our primary caregiver. It is play without words. As we get older, we place less and less emphasis on play, right? We might even feel guilty about it. It's unproductive. Or we think we lack the time to play. What are your excuses? My go-to is, I'll get to it later, there's just too much going on. But is there? I mean, what is really more important than our fundamental need for joyful creation? It turns out, people think almost everything is more important than play. <laughs> yeah, surprise, which is why the journal Pediatrics recently issued a clarion call to doctors to start issuing prescriptions for play. These prescriptions were a reaction to the elimination of mandatory recess in schools. We know that physical activity increases blood flow, right? And it sends oxygen to the brain. This oxygen boost promotes the growth of nerve cells in the learning and memory areas. Play optimizes the learning experience and it benefits us our whole lives if we stay active. George Bernard Shaw said, we don't stop playing because we grow old. We grow old because we stop playing. For kids displaced by war, opportunities for safe areas to play and even rudimentary toys and games can be nearly impossible to find. Many of them are growing old before their time. This is Aisha and her five daughters, ages four to 19. They left their home city of Aleppo when the father was killed in an airstrike. When I met them, they were on their way to try to sign the two youngest daughters up for school. Again, this would be their fourth or fifth attempt. Aisha, whose name means life, in Arabic couldn't provide the permanent address needed because they'd been living on the streets like many urban refugees. The girls weren't free to wa wander around and play because it was dangerous and unfamiliar. School would be that safe haven, but they would have to get very lucky because only about 34% of refugee kids are able to attend school. 
most exist in that liminal space. It's a kind of purgatory. But play can turn boredom into creativity and hardship into inspiration. For Aisha's daughters, it could help process the loss of their dad and the ongoing trauma of displacement. Aisha and her daughters are why my organization, Hadaya, exists. Hadaya, which means gifts in Arabic, provides timeless toys like balls, puzzles, blocks, jump ropes, and books to displaced kids just like Aisha's daughters and Omar around the world. In fact, the first distribution we made was on a return trip to Omar's camp and all the camps around it. It was about 750 kids. We partner with local on-the-ground organizations that embed themselves in the communities where refugees live, like Maha's Montessori, Echo for Refugees. There are many of them. And then there are large organizations like the Lego Foundation and Sesame Workshop that are working on big projects to bring play opportunities to hundreds of thousands of displaced kids. That really inspires me. This is six-year-old Shema. The middle of three siblings, she was tiny for her age. For her, play would help relieve the constant anxiety of just being in survival mode all the time. Flying a kite, the wind could be her ally. Inside of a book, she could be anyone, anywhere. She was free, free to just be a kid. Hers is the face I always go back to when I think about why this work is important to me and why play matters. Today, Shema is a teenager, statistically likely to have spent most of her childhood in a tent just over the border from her ancestral home. It's a common myth that refugee camps and settlements are just places people pass through, you know, on their way somewhere more permanent. The average length of stay is not weeks, it's not months, it's years. Years. So it's not what happens next for these kids, it's what happens now. Because the consequences of lack of play are profound. Research suggests that when young animals are deprived of play, it disrupts brain maturation and optimal learning. Self-control stops functioning properly. They can't distinguish friend from foe, and they have much less resilience to stress. But here's the disconnect. Only 3% of humanitarian aid is focused on education, and only a tiny percentage of that goes to young kids and play. Why is that? Because we don't prioritize play. We think it's a waste of time. We've lost our connection to one of our most fundamental biological impulses. We don't think it's a basic need, but it is. Kids like Omar and Shema understand this intuitively. That's why they're finding ways to play, like their lives depend on it because they do. I think we need to reframe the way we see the Omars and the Aishas and the Shemas of the world. They are not just refugees. They are human beings whose lives have value just because they exist. They are not social burdens. They are the teachers, scientists, and entrepreneurs of the future, our future. They are not just someone's kids. They are our kids. So what can we do? Support. Support individuals and organizations who are bringing play opportunities to displaced kids. Remember, it's not what happens next for Generation D. It's what happens now. 
Play brings us into the now. So let's prioritize it. Whether you're a CEO, an educator, or a retiree, I challenge you to bring play into your daily lives. You'll be more creative, happier, more productive. Play can be your new superpower. And my request to you is that you share this new superpower with Generation D. As the author and former refugee, Dina Nyeri says, it is the obligation of every person born in a safer room to open the door when someone in danger knocks. I'd like to suggest that when we open that door, we do so with a smile and with an invitation to play. On your marks, get set, play. Thank you.